do this rap shit. This is you. Oh, yeah, fly at a fly at a year airport all the time. Like, yeah, we did so convenient. And we built in US Air and, and a, uh, some air train. I can get, I get just about anything. Okay. Yeah, pretty nice. Welcome, everybody, to the work session uh, on September 26th. Uh, got some uh, great presentations here this evening. First would be a presentation, and first we welcome Donna Lawson uh, from NASA, as well as Stephen Jerzyk. And we really appreciate y'all coming out. Pocosin uh, thinks a lot of their relationship with the uh, NASA Langley uh, uh, facility, and uh, we're welcome, uh, definitely willing to hear what y'all have to present to us tonight. Okay, great. Well, well, thank you for the opportunity to share what's going on at NASA Langley with y'all. I really appreciate that. Um, we're fortunate to have the uh, city of Pocosin as a neighbor. We really value uh, the relationship. And um, uh, over 10% of our civil service workforce and many of our contractors live here in Pocosin. So real, real convenient, nice, nice commute. They have a very nice commute. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there, are, there are many changes going on um, within the agency and at NASA Langley. Um, as well as uh, opportunities that we're pursuing. And I uh, take the opportunity to tell you about some of those. We can go to the next chart. So um, International Space Station, um, is we finished construction of it and um, you know, wound down the shuttle program. Um, the president extended the lifetime of the station or funding for uh, the station until the year 2020. And Langley, as well as the other centers, will be engaged in research on station to prove out the technologies for long-duration human space travel. Because um, the ultimate destination is people on the surface of Mars. And so the station is a national research laboratory. And we'll be doing a lot of research <coughs> there um, in things like advanced materials for space systems. Um, we just got funded for a technology experiment to go on International Space Station. And you'll see the... SAGE-3 instruments, stratosphere, aerosol, and gas experiment. This is the third, obviously, in a series of them. And we'll be flying it as an externally attached uh, payload on International Space Station launching in 2014. And it'll continue to make measurements of uh, atmospheric properties, such as aerosols and trace gases, um, to allow us to do our atmospheric chemistry and dynamics research at the center. So that's an exciting opportunity. Go to the next chart. Um, we are also um, developing, uh, significantly involved in development of systems to replace the space shuttle. Um, we have been involved in the Orion spacecraft. It's now the, uh, we've evolved it to the multi-purpose crew vehicle, and it'll be the spacecraft, uh, a capsule, what looks like, looks like Apollo, only a lot, uh, quite a bit larger and reusable, unlike Apollo. We'll be, we'll be able to re recover it and reuse it. Uh, we've been involved in that for years now and will continue to be involved using our aerodynamics capabilities and other uh, structures, materials, capability, et cetera. Um, but about two weeks ago, the agency just announced the selection of what the new rocket's going to look like. It's called the Space Launch System. <coughs> and you see a picture of it there. And um, it's, uh, it's a, what we call a heavy lift launch vehicle, so it'll lift a, a significant amount of uh, payload to Earth orbit, and we need that uh, capability to be able to launch all the systems that will be required to go to destinations beyond the Earth, like the Moon or an asteroid or ultimately Mars. Um, so this is a big step forward for us. We um, will be involved in um, traditional things we do for launch vehicle development, like we did for shuttle aerodynamics and um, structures and materials, guidance, navigation, and control. You know, controlling the rocket. So. Traditional things we've done for launch vehicles will pass. Langley will do that for this vehicle. Um, we've, we also um, have the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport now established out at Wallops Island, Virginia. And um, Orbital Science, there are two companies we've co NASA's contracted with to re resupply the space station. Now that we do not have shuttle, our United States resupply of the space station will be through um, two commercial companies. Once of the, one of them is located in Virginia, up in northern Virginia, or near Dulles Airport, Orbital Sciences Corporation. And they'll be launching their rocket, called the Taurus II, out of Wallops Island. Uh, so that'll be exciting. You'll see a pretty, bu pretty big rocket launching off the eastern shore of Virginia. Um, the first test flight will be in December of, of, uh, this ye of this year, and the first flight to resupply the station will be in early calendar 2012. So we're looking forward, forward to that. And now I think we've got a video, an animation of the new launch vehicle. 
So like the Space Shuttle, it will be ver uh, integrated vertically at, down at the Kennedy Space Center. And you see so, two things that look, probably look, might look familiar to you. Those two uh, rocket motors uh, on the side of the main rocket are from the Space Shuttle. They are the, shuttle, sh the solid rocket motors derived from the, from the shuttle. We developed them into a slightly larger um, capability as part of the last program. The main engines, the things you'll see at the firing off at the bottom of the rocket, are from the space shuttle. They are space shuttle main engines. The next generation, like the 25 E's, RS 25 E's, so five of them down there. And again, they'll initially start off with a modest capability of about um, 70 metric tons to orbit, and then we'll evolve it to a much more robust capability of 130 metric tons. So there it is. First test flight of the new spacecraft will be in 2014. We're looking forward to that. Probably the first flight of that vehicle will be in 2017 or so time frame. Okay, next chart. Okay, we're still, we're st we still do a lot of aeronautics research, um, both for NASA and for Department of Defense, Federal Aviation Administration, and we work with the big guys, the Boeings and Lockheeds, as well as the smaller guys like the Gulf Streams and even some uh, U.S.-based international uh, companies like Honda Jet, which is actually based in Greenberg, Greensboro, North Carolina, um, to, do, to collaborate on research, do wind tunnel testing, and even some flight testing. Uh, I could spend hours talking about the aeronautics research. We've done. It still is almost about half of what we do at the center. I'm just going to highlight two areas that are uh, where we're really making, starting to make some advances. Um, the first is in doing research to support the Federal Aviation Administration as well as the DOD in the next generation air traffic management system. So if you, you've flown recently, like say Delta out of Patrick Henry, and you're going to Atlanta, you know that if there's weather in Atlanta, you're in trouble. So the hub and spoke system can only handle so much traffic and it, and it has these choke points called hubs, you know, US Air in Charlotte and Delta in Atlanta. So we're trying to devise a system um, that is much more flexible and can handle things like um, do dynamic rerouting and handle things like bad weather and, and the higher volume of traffic. And so we're looking at putting more information in the cockpit, situational awareness and information in the cockpit with the pilots, and that mostly is traffic and weather. Um, using advanced technology that we actually help, it, help invent. And so we're using our uh, air traffic operations lab. We can, with computers, we can simulate hundreds of aircraft flying around in the airspace. And our, our simulators, our cockpit simulators, where we bring in pilots that get to try the new displays and the new controls in the aircraft uh, in a simulated environment with lots of aircraft flying, and they can give us feedback on how, if that helps them or it hurts them, it's too much to information to deal with, not enough information, et cetera. So we're doing all that. Again, it's in collaboration with the Federal Aviation Administration. And then we also are lead a program called Environmentally Responsible Aviation. And we're looking at uh, doing three, meeting three goals, significantly reducing um, fuel burn. Um, fuel costs are now more the predominant cost of airline airliners. It used to be the people. It used to be the pilots and the cabin crew. It's now fuel has become more than 50% of the cost of running an airline. And so there's renewed emphasis on reducing fuel burn. Reducing noise, our goal in reducing noise is to confine the objectionable noise to the perimeter of the airport. So if uh, authority wants to put an airport in your, near your neighborhood, you don't care because you won't hear the noise. Um, so that's, a, that's, that's really far out there, but that's what we're shooting for. And then reduce emissions. Reduce the gases that can cause um, deterioration of, say, uh, the ozone or uh, cause climate change. Um, it's really hard to design an aircraft to do all three of those things simultaneously, so there's lots of work to do. We're looking at advanced configurations. You see a picture of kind of a flying wing, a blended wing body. It has benefits of reduced drag and reduced noise and reducing fuel burn and as, well, as well as emissions. Um, we're also developing technologies and testing those um, in, uh, on the ground and in flight. Um, so lots of good work going on there and lots to do, um, lots, lots of uh, good research and technology development in aer aeronautics still. So next chart. Uh, science, we have a small but pretty uh, nationally, internationally well-known, uh, recognized science group. It's, again, it's focused mainly on atmospheric science and in two areas, atmospheric chemistry and uh, climate change and measuring, making measurements related to climate change. So you see the cloud and earth rate and energy system. We flew the first instrument uh, of this type in 1984. 
We've flown five of these instruments on three different spacecraft. And now the science community has decided we need these instruments, make these measurements over decades uh, to really do the climate research that's needed moving forward. And so uh, we're being funded by essentially the Weather Service, National Oceanic, Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration through the Weather Service to fly the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th instruments as we move out. Um, the next instrument will be uh, launching on a satellite out of um, Vandenberg Air Force Base on the West Coast on October 25th. So that'll be exciting. We're headed, for, uh, several of us are headed out for the launch and, uh, and that'll continue these critical measurements for climate change. And then you see um, on the upper right is um, the entry vehicle for the Mars uh, Science Laboratory. That's our next mission to land on the surface of Mars. We're landing a robot, a rover. Um, it's twice the size of the last rovers that we landed on Mars, Spirit and Opportunity, uh, part, part of the uh, Mars Exploration Rover Project. It's essentially the size of a Mini Cooper. It's a large machine, has 11 science instruments. It's going to do some amazing uh, science when it gets to the surface. And it's nuclear powered. Uh, the others were so powered by solar rays. This actually has a little radioisotope thermal generator. We call it a nuclear power source. It's actually not a reactor, but just a, it, generate, it uses nuclear in, uh, material to generate heat, and we convert that into electricity and, and, uh, and keep. So Langley has an instrumentation package. Uh, similar to what we used to had in the nose of the shuttle when the shuttle first fly, flew to make um, uh, measurements of vehicle performance. That's called Medley. And, but we also d did what we did on every successful Mars landing, and that is the end-to-end -end simulation of the entry, descent, and landing from the point where it hits the atmosphere all the way down to the ground using all our air sciences capabilities at the center. So that's really exciting. I've spent quite a bit of time out at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the last year going through a set of reviews to make sure that we got all that right and we can set successfully land on, on Mars. So now I have a video of the landing and it's kind of an impressive system. Um, so this vehicle looks just like the vehicle that Langley came up with for the Viking landings in 76. So Viking was led out of Langley. It was the first successful landing that any country has done on Mars. Um, and we're using that same kind of, kind of vehicle. And you'll see in a second there'll be a parachute that comes out. And it comes out at very high speed uh, when we're going faster than the speed of sound. And that parachute is also the same type of parachute that the Vikings, Viking guys developed. So we're still leveraging a lot of what they did back in the 70s. Um, but you'll see the, towards the end of it, you'll see the actual landing uh, system at the end is completely new because we're delivering a much heavier, larger system to the surface. See the parachute open and we're slowing down, so now we're below the speed of sound. And then you'll see the amazing part, at least I think so. Um, the, the rover is underneath a, a descent stage. And there are eight rocket engines that fire and slow the descent of the rover, the descent stage system, down in, to a hover over the surface of Mars. And there's a fairly sophisticated radar system that controls all this. And then you'll see the rover being lowered down on a tether. And we call this the sky crane. So the rover's lowered down on a tether. Then it hits the surface, you see that the wheels are deploying, and then they cut the tether and then the descent stage flies away. So that's how we're landing this much more massive system on the surface of Mars. Before we used airbags for the last three. We deployed airbags and hard landing, they bounced on the surface and then we deployed those. And there you see it landed and we fly away. So, next, you can punch the next chart. So that launch of the Mars Science Lab is out of Cape Kennedy, at the end of November, the launch window opens end of November, it'll go through December. Um, it's a nine-month trip to Mars, so the landing will be in August, early August of 2012. So that'll be, I'll be hopeful, I will hopefully be out at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the control center for the landing. That'll be very cool. So that's kind of some of the things we're doing in science. Um, and we, we have a plan to revitalize the infrastructure at the center. So you probably notice uh, we're tearing things down. And that's part of the plan. Uh, the most visible thing we're tearing down is a 16-foot wind tunnel right along Armistead Avenue. We closed that facility probably about five or six years ago. Um, there, are other tra there are two other transonic tunnels at Langley and a, a large transonic tunnel uh, that the Air Force has in Tennessee. So we still have that test capability, we, and that's why we closed 16-foot. 
Um, but that's part of the plan to kind of um, demolish the old infrastructure that we don't need and that's expensive to uh, operate and maintain and build new buildings. So we just completed the uh, first new building at the center. On the upper left, we had the ribbon cutting in June, and that's a new headquarters building. It's a new office building. And then we've, we have funding in the budget for our second new building. It's kind of a new conference center, collaboration center, um, cafeteria. Um, and it'll be, uh, we're going to break ground on it in the spring of 2012. Uh, we're getting bids, we're reviewing bids right now in 2012. And then the third building will be a sensor and instrumentation laboratory. Probably build that one in two phases, and we're funding for it. It is still in the budget. And the fourth building will be a new structures and materials lab. And we have a fifth building in the plan. Right now it's on the books to be an office building, but we're looking at what's the best plan for that fifth building on out. Um, you know, it replaces, like I said, it replaces old infrastructure that's uh, expensive to operate and maintain. Um, for example, our first building is um, a green building. It's LEED certified platinum. Um, so very, very energy efficient. Uh, you know, uses uh, materials that are environmentally friendly, low water usage, et cetera. And so the payback that we'll get by demolishing old and building new is, is relatively quickly in, in terms of years, eight to ten years on the payback. So, um, and we're now, we now have a team looking at um, the rest of the infrastructure at the center, particularly the labs and facilities, and developing a plan um, to include in our master plan that will cover the entire infrastructure at the center and what we need to revitalize and keep the center healthy um, for the long term. So that's some of what we're institutionally what we're doing at the center. And then we put in uh, some new, we have uh, put in some new technical capabilities in some of our major test facilities. Um, this is the, the lander facility, also known as the gantry, very visible from Pocosin. And it started out as a lunar landing simulator, and then we used it as a crash test facility to uh, do crash testing of small aircraft and, and helicopters. And now it's back to supporting exploration and, and doing landing system testing for the new spacecraft, the Orion or multipurpose crew vehicle. So we did a lot of land landing testing and systems to, uh, for this vehicle to land on land. And now we put in, uh, the program funded us to put in a, a hydro basin, essentially a big, fairly large swimming pool. Uh, underneath the lander to do land landing testing. And you see in the lower right, we've done some testing of uh, just uh, uh, prototypes to shake down the facility. And next year, we'll actually do a testing of the pro a prototype of the actual spacecraft. We also got, uh, we also received stimulus funding to uh, improve some of our uh, wind tunnel facilities. Um, in our National Transonic Facility, we got funding to put in a new data system to improve productivity, as well as to replace systems to improve the reliability of that facility. And that's only um, that's a that's a unique facility. We do uh, actually do cryogenic. We cool the air down, and as we blow through that facility, and there's only two of the, uh, of those uh, type wind tunnels in the world. One here in, uh, located in Langley, and one in uh, Germany. Um, and we, then in our subsonic wind tunnel, large scale subsonic wind tunnel. Um, that's just down the road on Armstead from the 16 foot, our 14 by 22. We put a capability, we're putting a capability in there to do uh, noise measurements on new aircraft configurations, like you saw that blended wing body, to actually measure the noise, at least on a subscale aircraft in, in a wind tunnel environment and see how effective the new, uh, the new types of aircraft and the new technologies are. So those, that's both, uh, both of those things are pretty exciting for us. Okay, next chart. Um, we get a lot of 911 calls and we come up with new and innovative ideas that are not necessarily related directly to NASA. So you'll see the Chile Chilean miners rescue, a gentleman from Langley, Kurt Craig, who works in the NASA en Engineering and Safety Center, as well as three physicians from the Johnson Space Center were asked to consult on the Chilean, Chilean miner rescue. They went down to Chile and they consulted on everything from um, how, the, how to help the miners deal with the isolation uh, to helping them develop the um, capsule that eventually they were pulled out of um, and rescued from. So they actually re received the service to America medal from uh, Charles Bolden and got to, uh, got to go over to the White House for that. So that was pretty, pretty neat. Uh, NESC drew on the expertise from Langley and around the country to work uh, help uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration uh, to look in to investigate the Toyota Sudden, Toyota Sudden Acceleration problem. Um, and w so far haven't found, you know, anything th that would cause that, but we're still working on it. We're still working with uh, Toyota and NHTSA on that. 
We also used some of our science remote sensing data um, to help with the uh, Gulf oil spill. Um, we have laser systems that make measurements from space, so we could actually not only measure the ex you know, geographic extent of the spill, but also look at how far down in the water the spill was and look at the structure of the oil underneath the surface of the water. So that helped, the, helped in, the, um, in, the, in the cleanup operations. And then one of our researchers, research engineers, Chris Edwards, um, invented this child protection sensor, and it was actually motivated by a tragedy that we had at the, at the center. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a sensor system that um, if a person leaves their child in the car and works, walks a certain distance away from the car, they have a little fob on their keychain which will alert them that their child is still in the car, and so they can, uh, they can go back and get them um, to avoid that, that uh, future tragedies from happening. So that's the, some of our kind of non-aerospace applications of some of the expertise that we have. And then um, we're very active in education and in the community. Um, we established our first day of education. It's kind of similar pattern after the day of, uh, of caring, where um, over, over 100 of our researchers went out into schools throughout the area and um, talked about NASA and tried to create excitement for studying science, technology, engineering, and math in, 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 uh, in grade schools, uh, middle schools, and high schools. Um, we worked with the Boy Scouts on creating a robotics merit badge. We're also significantly involved in the first robotics competition that they have up in Richmond. Um, we, get a, we have 250 students that are in our student pipeline, and in the summer we get a big influx of those students, everything from you know, high school students all the way through undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral students. Um, we established um, the Virginia Aerospace Science and Technology Scholars Program. Um, that has an online curriculum that high school juniors do during the year, and then a subset of them get selected to come to the center for a one-week design project with mentors, for, uh, NASA engineers who are mentors. And we've gotten tremendous feedback on that program, and um, it's, uh, we have uh, kids from high schools all over the state that come to Langley in the summer. And then there's our Speakers Bureau. We've got a great set of folks that, in our Speakers Bureau that come out and talk to uh, schools on request, uh, talk to uh, local governments, talk to um, uh, civic organizations, et cetera, and they do a really nice they do a really nice job in getting out in the community. Next chart. So um, we ha we have had uh, budget challenges over the past years, and we've been able to deal with those. Um, you know, we're most likely going to have budget challenges moving forward, um, but we think we've you know we've got uh, plans in place um, to keep the center as a significant contributor to NASA and the, and the aerospace enterprise in the nation. So we think you know moving forward, there's a lot of good work for us to do, and we're re revitalizing the infrastructure at the center. And uh, so we uh, you know we plan to be around for a while longer. We were established in 1917. 95th anniversary next year, hopefully, in, the, in six, year, uh, six years or so, our 100th anniversary. I hope I'm still around working at the center to see that. It's going to be really exciting. So, again, thanks for, the, thanks for uh, allowing me to come and talk to you a little bit about what's going on at Langley. Thank you. And I really appreciate it. I tell you, it's tremendously exciting work that you're doing out there. And I, I am so impressed that, you know, that NASA is working so hard on NASA Langley working so hard on this revitalization. Um, one thing council may uh, learn from, on your buildings, uh, you're actually reducing your square footage by, you're required to reduce by two to one ratio or something like that? Correct. Um, maybe something that, that we want to look at in the long term as we revitalize, but they're, they have to demolish two times the square foot that you're going to build. Yeah, that's our, that's, that's the plan moving forward is mm -hmm. for every, uh, one foot square foot gross square foot we build we demolish two gross square feet and you know we're using the essentially the modern building configurations uh, which involves some offices but a lot of open space also to improve you know to reduce the amount of square footage that we have so between that and the fact that these buildings are so much more energy efficient than a lot of the buildings at you know, that Langley that were built in the 50s um, you know, we're going to significantly reduce our, our operations costs, and we want to put that back into the institution and to keep, keep the revitalization going, um, as, uh, address our backlog of maintenance and repair on buildings that we plan on keeping, that we won't be demolishing, that we'll be rehabilitating and maintaining. And so, um, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, as we move forward, that'll help us kind of get ahead of the curve on some of our uh, maintenance activities. Does that mean that the steam plant will one day be obsolete? 
You know, I don't think so. maybe one day, but we don't have any plans to uh, to to uh, for the steam plant to be obsolete. Um, that's still an active partnership with the you know with the the city and the and the Air Force. At one time, it was the Air Force, and um, so yeah, we we get a lot of our our steam uh, from the plant. And it got very expensive for us when that plant was down, and we had to use natural gas to generate that steam. That got that got pretty expensive for us. So um, that that trash burning plant does reduce our energy costs by quite a bit to operate the center. We have worked with the city of Hampton to improve the operations of the facility there. And we've invested some in that in the into, in the facility <coughs> to improve the operations, and so uh, that was done probably a couple of years ago. So you don't see that going away anytime soon, but sooner or later, hopefully, there'll be new technology that'll be, um, you know, that'll come along that'll be much more efficient and, and also environmentally friendly. Who knows? We may be, you know, we may be working on some things now that could pan out. That vehicle that lowers the medley. Yes. When it flies off, what, is, what does it do? Just orbit Mars? No, it crashes into the surface of Mars. So it's going to fly away and crash into the surface it, it, of Mars it, 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 a, safe, a safe distance from the from the rover and uh, and then the rover gets to drive off and do its do its work yeah and do its science work so yeah it actually crashes in any other questions price tag on that <laughs> on the rover and the uh, I mean is there you know you know to, to, to bring it up to Mars you know, the, the rover and drop it down or whatever and to, to, to expend the other expendable pieces is there a money price tag um, that that total project, that total project's price tag was, is probably now about a little over two billion dollars. <coughs> so it's, a, it's one of our we call we we started it started out as a smaller project, but we would call that a flagship mission now. And um, and they um, the launch actually got delayed. You know we couldn't get the system ready for a 2009 launch, but we're ready for 2011. We are going in November. And um, and um, but yeah, it was, it's it's um, it was a it was a real challenge to figure out how to develop and land something, you know, the size of a small car with that um, very sophisticated science instrumentation. But we'll be doing science uh, and looking for at the composition of the atmosphere and the. The soil at Mars, looking for present or past signs of life, um, that we could not do until now. Much more sophisticated instrumentation that we've had on Viking and even on the Pathfinder uh, rover Spirit and Opportunity. So it should be exciting. Just out of curiosity, Steve, the vehicle that flies off after the after it lands, the vehicle on Mars, are you going to take opportunity? Of it? of its crashing to get seismic data? I don't think so, but that's not a bad idea. Um, we're, uh, we're going to, one of, the, one of the nice things now on Mars is we have a camera that has good enough resolution in orbit, uh, you know, so we can see much smaller things on the ground. So we actually caught a picture of the parachute in the, in the, back, in the back shell that, uh, from the uh, Phoenix mission. So we'll actually at least get some pictures of what happens and where the hardware is and what happens to it from Mars orbit that we couldn't before. And we have much more pictures of the surface of Mars now to actually plan where we were going to land this time. I asked Tom Young, um, who's the pro, you know, deputy project manager on Viking, lives out on the eastern shore now. You know, how did they do, how did they figure out where they were going to land? How did the Viking guys figure out where they were going to land? And he goes, well, it wasn't a problem. We really didn't have any data. We just had to take our best guess and hope for the best. And where they landed turned out to be way rockier than they had predicted, but they got lucky, and twice they landed successfully. Um, but, you know, part of it was good engineering. Those guys were amazing because what they did, I mean, we have, you know, with, between computers and software, we have engineering tools that those guys couldn't even dream of back in the 70s, which makes what they did even more impressive. And also the fact that they didn't have, they, you know, this was the first land. They didn't have a lot of knowledge of the planet. It, it, it was pretty, what they did was really impressive. Uh, I was just curious because you know the mass of that vehicle, and so, so you'll know what kind of energy is impacted. Yep. And it might give you some geography. Yeah, well, that's a great idea. Anything? Any other questions? Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the. Thank you for, for the opportunity. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Don. Okay. And our second presentation this evening is from Ken Spirito, and, and this is. Uh, you're from uh, Newport News? From well, the Airport. Newport News, Williamsburg International Airport. And, uh, and you have been, uh, y'all have been in the news here lately, so we're, we have. we're definitely we, We've been in the news uh, quite a bit lately, uh, some good, some not so good. Uh, but first and foremost, thank you for allowing me to come and present you on. I've talked to, to some of you, um, you know, briefly offline at other events. 
uh, but certainly a pleasure to come before you and, and, and give you a brief update of what's going on. And, and also, uh, I'm, not also, I'm not only representing the airport, I'm also representing the Regional Air Service Development Group that you all uh, participate in, and, and we have a, a great a great asset in Dave Callis in representing you all uh, with RAISE uh, in making air service development opportunities real on, on the uh, peninsula, and we thank you very much for that. Because moving forward, it's, it's, it's going to be even more important that we stay focused on the opportunities that lie ahead of us to develop air service. Uh, the first uh, bit of news uh, that you all, I'm sure, are aware of uh, is the decision for Southwest Airlines to pull the air trans service out of our market uh, come March 9th of 2012. I want to set the record straight. It was a Southwest Airlines decision. Uh, it was not made by AirTran, and AirTran has been with us for the last 16 years doing very well. Uh, this was a strategic move, or is a strategic move, uh, from Southwest Airlines uh, because of their service in Norfolk, and uh, they are planning on serving uh, the Richmond Airport. So they feel that uh, by bookending us uh, the way they want to uh, be present here in Southeast Virginia. <clears throat> so uh, what does that mean for us? AirTran leaving this market March 9th, uh, they'll be leaving behind 485,000 passengers at our airport, which accounts for about 45 percent of our traffic. It's pretty significant. Uh, they serve nonstop to New York LaGuardia, Boston, Orlando and, uh, and Atlanta with connections throughout their system. I think most airport directors would jump off the control tower if that would happen at their airport. But we're not going to we're not going to look at this uh, we're not going to look at this um, situation as uh, a moment to reflect on all the negative. We're going to look at the positive. We're going to look at the opportunities that lie ahead of us. And believe it or not, with 45 percent of our market, AirTran which was a great airline and served this community very well for 16 years, actually kept us from growing. Because of their market share and because of the low fares, it kept other airlines from really coming in and expanding and, and actually providing us with, with more service uh, than we have today. So as well as AirTran has served us over the many years, because of their market share and the, and the low fares that they've had, uh, it actually kept us from growing. So we're going to take this opportunity to take that 45 percent and split it up amongst other airlines. <clears throat> Gives us the opportunity to diversify ourselves. Because as you know, the airlines aren't a healthy business. Uh, we don't know what's going to come tomorrow or the next day or the next day after that in terms of consolidation or bankruptcy uh, because of fuel costs are, get, are growing each day. So we have to be sure that we uh, look at our air service development from a diversification perspective. We need to diversify our product and no longer, no longer depend on one airline, and that was AirTran. So uh, moving forward, we're going to take that service and uh, certainly go and talk to every airline we can possibly talk to that makes sense out of Newport News, and we've been doing that since September of, of, of this past year. Because when the announcement was made back in September that, that Southwest was going to buy AirTran, we took a proactive position and started talking to other airlines. So we started telling our story way back in September of October of last year. So a lot of the airlines are fully aware of what's going on in our market and have a common message. We're just going to wait to see what Southwest does in your market. And now that that's happened, we were able in such a short period of time, announced the first new service uh, to replace, in part, what AirTran is leaving behind, and that's Allegiant Air. Allegiant Air uh, will be a brand new airline to our area. They're not a stranger to Virginia. They, they fly out of Roanoke, and they've been in Roanoke uh, for about five years now. Uh, but Allegiant is a significant, significant airline with a niche product. Uh, they're actually the, the second most profitable airline in U.S. history. <clears throat> But not a lot of you have heard of Allegiant Air because that's their plan, is to stay below the radar so that the bigger carriers like a Delta or U.S. Air do not get concerned about uh, their, their penetration into a market. Allegiant will start November 16th and fly nonstop to Orlando Sanford Airport, which is the airport just north of Orlando International. And uh, they'll begin November 16th with four flights a week. 
and the fares are as low as $35 each way. Right now, you can go on AllegiantAir.com and buy a nonstop flight for as little as $35 each way. Of course, that's not without the taxes. Uh, I think about with the taxes and everything, it comes out to about $60 or so uh, each way to Orlando, which is still far below what Airtran is charging today. I think their lowest price is about $89. Uh, or $100, depending on the day that you travel. So effectively, uh, Allegiant Air will replace the Orlando portion of the service. Now, what's important about Allegiant is they're, they're very conservative, yet they're aggressive when people respond to their product. If we can fill those airplanes to Orlando, which we, we should be able to because we've demonstrated that with, with AirTran for many years, uh, they could add other Florida destinations or even out to Las Vegas. Uh, Allegiant's uh, primary <coughs> hub, if you will, uh, their focus city is Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, so we're hoping to grow into other Florida destinations and then possibly out to Las Vegas. Again, going back to the diversity part, Allegiant will allow us to grow at other destinations that we've never had before. So it's very, very important to bring this airline into this community. We've been working with them for over a year. Okay, so they're very familiar with our market. They're very excited to be here, and uh, we're hoping that the public uh, supports them in every way possible. If you can go to the next slide, you may see some of our ads uh, in the newspaper. Uh, we're also uh, on TV, and, and we're going to get the product aware, awareness to as many people on the peninsula and in Richmond and on the south side as well uh, to support this. And you'll see the fifty nine ninety nine. That's basically with all your taxes and, and fees included. So we encourage you to visit their website at AllegiantAir.com if you're planning on going to Orlando. Uh, give them a try. If you go to the next slide, just to give you a familiarization of the type of aircraft, that's the MD-83 aircraft. That has 150 seats. So it's a large airplane with, uh, with all the amenities uh, that other airlines have, and uh, uh, we hope that you support them in every way. Now, Allegiant, again, is the replacement for Orlando. So now we're looking at New York, Boston, and connectability through a hub, hub and spoke like Atlanta. So we're talking to low, other low fare carriers out there that could support or provide those, uh, those other services, and I think we're going to be very successful. Uh, the, the, the things that we've uh, been, the things we've been talking about and the direction that the airlines have been going uh, with us and saying to us leads us to believe that we should be able to hopefully replace that service before AirTran leaves in March. So again, we're being as aggressive as we can be, and we're doing everything that we can possibly do to ensure that uh, everybody knows the opportunities available out of our airport. Uh, and having uh, folks like NASA, the military, the government, uh, you know, I, there, there are three reasons why people come here. You have the military and government, you have regular business and industry, and then you have tourism. So those three things are really going to help us uh, articulate our message to the airlines and convince them to uh, either expand in our airport or uh, bring on new service. Uh, Frontier Airlines. Everybody hopefully is fr familiar with Frontier Airlines. Uh, we brought them here uh, nonstop to Denver uh, last May, and they've done very well. Unfortunately, because of fuel, uh, they've had to take a step back and, and, uh, and downgrade the service from uh, year-round to seasonal. Uh, but the, the things we're hearing as, as fuel... Uh, becomes more affordable, uh, they'll be able to uh, bring that service back year-round. Uh, their last flight was in September, September 11th, and they'll be back uh, the first week in March. So that's already loaded in the system. So if you've used that service in the past, continue to, to use them. They'll be back in March. And uh, from what they're telling us, uh, they're, gonna, they're going to uh, at least stay the season through uh, December. So uh, I think it looks like January and February are the only, the only two questionable months uh, that uh, they see a, a significant drop in traffic. But again, they'll be back in March. And one significant point about Frontier, or I should say two significant points, one, and if you've, if you've flown them last time, uh, they had an evening uh, departure, an early evening departure around 5.30, got you out to Denver around 7.30 or so um, uh, their time. Uh, they're changing the schedule a little bit. Uh, they'll now arrive here in the evening at about 10.30 in the evening, and they'll depart the next morning at 8.30 in the morning. So it'll get you into Denver at about 10.30 in the morning and give you a significant amount of connections through the Denver hub 
and get you to the west coast uh, before noon. Uh, so it's going to be a significant, significant change that will benefit the business traveler. So we're very excited about that because it, it, it brings on a lot more opportunities since we're losing some connected, connectability through Atlanta when AirTran leaves. It'll give the business traveler more options. And Frontier said if they see a significant increase in bookings, that they will respond and add more service since AirTran will be leaving uh, the first part of March when, uh, when Frontier comes back into the market. So we're, we're fine-tuning ourselves a little bit and adjusting ourselves with the economy and making sure that uh, all of our airlines know and understand how important this market is. And uh, we've talked to Delta, we've talked to U.S. Air, and they too are looking at this market for hopefully some expansion come uh, springtime. So above all, this airport, just rest assured that this airport is doing everything we can to keep it from going to the south side and taking flights out of the out of the other airport, uh, but we do realize you have a choice, and we appreciate all the opportunities you give us to serve you. And I am available at any time uh, to talk to any groups to uh, to to make any information available that you may need uh, moving forward. Uh, one last thing uh, about uh, Frontier: uh, we've been talking to them about other possible services as well, not only Denver, but other points around the United States that may make sense out of this airport to serve this community the way it needs to be served. So with that, uh, I'd love to take any questions or, or uh, any comments that you may have about air service. I have three. Yeah. Number sure. one, uh, in your conversation with Frontier, mm -hmm. do you know if they will be considering Vegas as an opportunity since it's a, it's a western destination? And the move of AirTran from Newport News, what impact will that have on the traffic count relative to the tower staying in operation in hours? And the third thing, will Disney Express move its services or, or, or at least expand its services over to the Orlando Stanford Airport? To address your first question about um, Las Vegas, uh, Frontier will not do Las Vegas out of our airport only because you, they'll have significant connectability over Denver uh, and that would just detract away from the Denver hub uh, so we're, we're very confident that uh, with the schedule change with the connectability and the fare structure out of our airport through Denver that someone can find their way uh, to Las Vegas not only on Frontier but uh, certainly on Delta and US Air as well. Uh, the operations uh, for the tower uh, the 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 uh, air tran flights, depending on the, the month, have anywhere between eight and nine departures a day. It's about 4% of our operations, roughly. Uh, so it's not a significant amount. And then when you add in what we'll be gaining with Allegiant, uh, we'll, we'll see a small impact, but we're hopeful, we're hopeful that other airlines are going to increase not only the, the size of their aircraft, but the frequency of their aircraft and other destinations. So that should make up for the eight to nine departures a day we see uh, with AirTran. As far as the Disney Express, uh, Allegiant uh, obviously serves the, the Sanford Airport. I don't believe the Disney Express at this point, at this point, serves Allegiant uh, out of, out of uh, Sanford. Well, I know they don't, but I don't know if there are any plans for I, I think I think they've been talking to Disney because Allegiant was, for a brief period, split their operation up last year between Orlando International and Sanford, and that was because of the Disney Express, believe it or not. And I, they've reverted back to Sanford, and I think because of that move, uh, the Disney Express, I think, is talking with Allegiant to, to serve that airport. I'm not sure exactly where it is, but I, I do know that they're, they're always talking I about bringing that apart. service up there. No, they're not. They're not very far apart at all. Other questions? Just comment that you've managed to increase uh, traffic count in Newport News for the last several years in a row, mm -hmm. and that's impressive considering how you hemmed in with Richmond and Norfolk, and uh, they're unable to do that. So you've got an outstanding record. And I, I appreciate that. I, I, too, can talk for a long time about all of our achievements, uh, uh, and, and, and one that in 2010 we'd had our best year ever, both financially and both in terms of passengers at the airport in its entire history. Uh, we've completely changed our business model and are taking, uh, you know, different or making different opportunities available for our customers, mainly with the military and government travelers. We were able to successfully work with the GSA 
to increase the opportunities for military and government travelers to fly out of our airport. And, and the example we were using to the airlines happens to be Disney World. Not serving the military and government on the, on the peninsula is like serving Orlando and not paying attention to Disney World travelers. This is our market. It's full and rich of, of government contractors and military and government workers. Mm -hmm. uh, this is our market, and they need to take advantage of that uh, to some degree and increase their service. So we were able to successfully work with GSA to make that available, and that's why, in part, we've seen a significant increase in our passengers. So we're hoping to take that momentum forward, and it looks like 2011 will be our best year ever as well. <laughs> so moving into 2012 with, with Air Tran leaving, uh, hopefully it won't, uh, it will be a short-term uh, issue for us, and, and hopefully we'll have the service replaced even before um, March 9th comes around. Wait, does Thank Air you. Tran service Virginia at all now? AirTran right now serves Richmond and uh, Newport News and serves Dullis. Yeah. But uh, the, I mean, with, with Southwest taking them over now, AirTran and Southwest used to go to Richmond. Right? That's correct. And, uh, are, are the, both airlines still going to continue to serve Richmond? No, what will happen, AirTran will completely go away. Uh, this time next year, that brand will be completely gone. The Boeing 717, that aircraft that AirTran uses, that over the next two years will be phased out and completely gone, and all will be left will, will be Southwest Airlines. Mm -hmm. Southwest's intentions of buying AirTran was to get rid of a competitor. AirTran was truly the low fare leader out there, and it was the biggest competitor to Southwest Airlines. Unfortunately, That's and you know, both of you have touched tonight on you know changing economics. We're we're seeing it in the city too. We're doing we're doing things with. With less, we've been we've had to step up to the plate to serve our citizens better. NASA has come under fire before, as far as you know, are, are you still relevant in the market? They've kind of reinvented themselves. I hear good things from Newport News as far as the airport, as well. It sounds to me like you've been given a challenge. You're on a high growth curve, mm -hmm. and you're just going to take the challenge on. And I mean, that's what we want the citizens to hear, and we appreciate you bringing that message here. Because to me, it's really, you know, I'm all about the region and Norfolk and uh, Richmond, and I want to see the state of Virginia do well, but I want to see the peninsula be a major part of that. And uh, so we wish you both uh, success as you create these changes and, and you make these changes in your organizations. And we appreciate you coming here tonight. The one thing I'll tell you is what can we do in, in regards to either one of you to, to – to help get that message out for, for you or to, um, to do other things as far as politically for the NASA arm. You know, what is it that the city can do? And you don't have to have an answer to that tonight. What I would tell you is that we're always a phone call away, mm -hmm. and uh, we will definitely uh, communicate for you where you need to be communicated, whether it's to our citizens or whether it's to our congressmen and our senators. Uh, on behalf of our citizens. So. Well, thank you for that. And for us, it, it's just that advocacy mm -hmm. and speaking on behalf of the airport and promoting the airport. Uh, one other statistic, we, the state of Virginia, just completed an economic impact study. You may have seen it in the, the Daily Press a week or so ago. Uh, we, we impact the area about $375 million. So that's a significant amount of money. Uh, we actually out our passengers, our visitors, outspend those who fly into Norfolk. So being a smaller airport in the state of Virginia, at least in southeast Virginia, we outspend the larger airport in the region. So it's very important that we keep as many passengers coming through our airport because uh, eventually they're going to spend money in this community and others, and they tend to spend more. Well, I, I think it's obvious that the Newport News Airport is a major advantage to the people who live on this side of the river. Uh, sure. Interstate 64 is a traffic nightmare of trying to get across either of the bridge tunnels. Mm -hmm. and, and going to Richmond is, is the same situation. And uh, it, it's a major advantage to have people to, to fly out of Newport News. You know, we strongly support that. And, and also private and public partnerships, uh, partnering with NASA and doing anything that we can to enhance uh, the research and development of, of the future of aeronautics because it is an important industry here on the peninsula. We need to keep that and do everything possible to, to enhance it. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.